But today I'll be going into a little bit of depth into the Vedic background of uh, this Vaishnava Dharma, this faith of worship of Krishna. And I will be comparing this Vedic background or Vedic orientation with uh, what we know as the Western religious tradition. So this is probably going to be, I hope, even though it's going to be a little bit uh, going into some specific or technical areas, I hope that you'll find it interesting because very often from our guests we get questions like, please tell us what is the difference or what is the similarity between the Hare Krishna religion and say Christianity or something like that. There's very often this kind of question. Uh, or is there any difference at all? So I'm going to focus on that today. Uh, this is coming to my mind because recently I was doing some, involved in some research for a book that I'm writing. <coughs> and in the course of the research I came across quite a few Western scholars of comparative religion and also uh, history of religions. And they're explaining what they call the Western religious tradition. And where they said, this is a number of scholars all saying the same thing. I'm going to use this board. That's another change. My normal Sunday piece. <laughs> so, how they explain the Western religious tradition is they start with a very ancient religion which is practically non-existent now. But it goes by the name Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism. Now, this very old religion, which goes many hundreds or perhaps, according to the Western idea, thousands of years before Christianity, before Jesus Christ, uh, was the state religion of ancient Persia. Now, the modern name of Persia is Iran. And this word Iran comes from the Sanskrit word Arya. So Persia is right next door to India. Uh, well, you can say right now with the political changes in the world, right next door to Persia is Pakistan. But Pakistan before 1948 was India. And uh, that region, Pakistan, and also a good part of Afghanistan, was in ancient times part of a great Vedic civilization. The capital city of the, uh, Afghanistan today is uh, Kandahar, and that's a version of a uh, Gandhari. There's a queen who married uh, Maharaj uh, Dhritarashtra. This is, this is in the Mahabharata. Her name was Gandhari. So she came from that place, modern day Kandahar, which is in Afghanistan. So these places on the border of ancient Persia were part of Vedic civilization, as was ancient Persia itself in very, very olden times. Therefore, this name Iran, which uh, is indicating that Persia, uh, ancient Persia was Aryadesh. So they were also following <coughs> Vedic civilization. So now, the modern Western scholars, as I said, they say that the Western religious tradition begins with this religion called Zoroastrianism, which started in Persia. Now, this religion was started by a priest, uh, a member of a caste in ancient Persia called the Magi. You may have heard of this word because it is said uh, we're coming to Christmas now, in a few days. And it is said when Jesus Christ uh, uh, was born, three, they're called to be wise men, came from the East 
and they are said to be Magi, and they followed a star to uh, visit uh, Jesus Christ in Bethlehem. So this Magi was a priestly caste, Brahmanas of ancient Persia, and they are also known in uh, Vedic scriptures by the name Magha. So the Maghas are a type of Brahmins who were uh, worshippers of the sun. They were uh, worshippers of Surya, sun, big sun god. They performed fire sacrifices. Now today, in western India around Bombay, there are the last few uh, thousand remnants of this ancient Zoroastrian religion. They're known as Parsis. Uh, the word Parsi comes from Persia. So when uh, the uh, Muslims invaded Persia, then those who wanted to remain true to this old religion, they left and went to India and settled in Bombay. And they're still doing these, this uh, old uh, style fire sacrifices. They invest uh, their sons when they get about 12 years old with a sacred thread. It's, it's a little bit different from the way it's done in India, but uh, you see these basic similarities. So, uh, how did this Zoroastrian religion start? So, as I said, there was a priest from this, the, among these Magis, these Brahmins, and his name uh, is uh, Zoroaster. Or um, Zarathustra, yeah. He's sometimes called Zarathustra. <laughs> Zoroaster is actually the, the Greek version of his name. And Zarathustra is how it looks in Persian. So, he was a priest who, who came with some innovations in this old Vedic uh, uh, sacrificial religion that was there in Persia. He made some significant changes in the doctrine, in the philosophy, which is said by Western scholars to be the originating point of the whole Western religious tradition. That means from here is coming first Judaism, Then, of course, Christianity. And at last, Islam, the Muslim religion. So all of this is said to be the Western religious tradition. So now, it's very interesting to note, this, this is what I found fascinating, uh, because what I've presented here basically is what you'll find uh, presented by a number of important Western scholars of religion. Uh, but what uh, I found remarkable is that this Zoroaster, this person Zarathustra, he's mentioned in the Rig Veda. So then you see a connection to uh, Vedic uh, culture, Vedic Dharma. In the Rig Veda, his name is Jaruta. <coughs> And Jaruta is described also as a priest, a priest of ancient times, who came into difficulty with a very famous ancient Vedic sage called Vashishta. Vashishta Muni. The Vashishta Muni appears in the Srimad Bhagavatam. <coughs> so uh, Vashishta uh, was actually the son of Varuna, Mitra Varuna, demigod. And so Vashishta naturally was a great worshipper of Varuna. Varuna is the demigod of the oceans, the underworld and the ocean. And also Jaruta was also a worshipper of Varuna. But they came into disagreement. And it turned out, according to the Rig Veda, that Vashishta cursed Jaruta. He cursed him and, and more or less then Jaruta was ejected from uh, Vedic society, from the 
Brahminical culture. He was considered like you might say a black sheep or something like that. Because he was teaching a different doctrine. And so uh, he came to Iran and in Iran he was able to successfully propagate his new doctrine. Now it's interesting, the, the Zoroastrian religion has its scripture which is called the Zen Vesta. which is written in a... Of course, this is not complete. There's only fragments of it left. But this is written in a language which is very similar to Sanskrit. And, and you'll be seeing this as I put some terms on the board. It's a very similar language to Sanskrit. So in the Zendavesta, the Zendavesta also confirms that there was a disagreement between uh, Zarathustra and Vashishta. In the Zendavesta, Vishishta's name is Vahista. Uh, uh, in that language, they are very often dropping, dropping the S's, so Vishishta becomes Vahista. Some people say that's how the word Hindu came around, came about, because uh, these people from Persia pronounced the river Sindhu, which separates India from the western part, they pronounced it as Hindu. Anyway, so we find it confirmed both in Rig Veda and in the Zoroastrian Zenda Avesta, that there was a conflict between these two. And uh, this Jaruta or Zoroaster, he was ejected from Vedic civilization, and in Persia, ancient Persia, he began to teach a new doctrine. So what was that new doctrine? Why do the Western uh, scholars say this is where uh, the Western religion begins? So one of the significant features of this new doctrine, which is very different uh, from the Vedic explanation, is a stark dualism. That means you have uh, God, uh, which uh, in this religion, Zoroastrian religion, is called Ahura Mazda, and I'm going to explain where this comes from. This is also very interesting. But anyway, this was their name of God. Ahura Mazda, and he's always fighting, always in a, a battle with an anti-god, in other words, a Satan. And uh, this um, Satan is called, uh, uh, has different names, Ar Arhiman is one name. Uh, actually, Better use another one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. These names you'll see, they may not make any sense to you now, but I'm going to explain them and you see the importance in a few seconds. So this is their picture, or this is their theological picture that there is a God, an uh, all-good God, and he has an enemy, a Satan. Uh, who, and they're always in constant conflict. And human <coughs> beings are caught in between the two. So, this is what... Now, the significance of this is that here you have a God who's not... Uh, apparently not actually in control, not fully in control of things, because he has an enemy, and they fight back and forth. And sometimes God may win, and sometimes the enemy may win. So there's a so the universe is depicted as a kind of struggle between good and evil, and and the line between good and evil falls right on the human race, you see, humanity. So therefore, some human beings are good, some are evil. It goes back and forth, and uh, we human beings are supposedly subject to these influences. So. This is, this is one difference between this Zoroastrian religion and the uh, older Vedic religion. And you can obviously see that it appears in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. The same idea is there, that there is a God and he is opposed by a Satan. Another uh, unique idea is the, idea, is the concept of a, uh, a judgment day that there is a, a, or apocalypse, that at some point in the future, the world, time will come to an end. 
time will come to an end and humanity will be judged. And how will they be judged? Their bodies will be resurrected. <coughs> the body that you died in will be brought out of the ground and you will be judged, good or evil. And so if you're good, and then according to the teaching of uh, this Jaruta, then the good human beings will inherit the earth and they'll get the, their bodies will last and last and last forever, I guess. And uh, they will be able to enjoy earth which will be made uh, pure and whole because there will be no more evil. The evil God will have been defeated. So everything is going to become very, very nice. And um, this apocalypse will be started by the appearance of a messiah. And in their, the ancient Avestan language, this was called the uh, Sayoshant. So the Sayoshant would be born of a virgin girl, and uh, uh, his appearance and his teachings would start this uh, uh, apocalypse, the end of time. So I think this is quite relevant because. We're now in the uh, last days of 1998. We have one more year before a promised millennium. <laughs> and there are many people who are saying that in the year 2000 that will be the apocalypse and more or less the same thing will happen. The bodies will rise out of the ground and be judged and the good will inherit the earth and the evil will go and burn in hell forever. <laughs> And, and on these, you know, all of these themes you certainly find in Islam, Christianity, Judaism, and it all starts here with the, the Zoroaster. So uh, and now I want to, after having explained these things, which I think everyone can understand and appreciate, I want to now go into a little deeper, uh, deeper into uh, the significance of these terms, because then you really start to see where this Zoroaster was drawing his ideas from it. It's very interesting. This name Ahura Mazda, which in the uh, Western language means wise lord, is actually uh, another name for Varuna, who I already mentioned, that both Vashishta and Jaruta were worshippers of Varuna. So Varuna in the Rig Veda has the name Asura Maya in Sanskrit. And here you can see it's transposed as Ahura Mazda. So Asura Maya, uh, Actually, what it means is Lord of the Demons. Because uh, Varuna, although he's a demigod, uh, he's the demigod who's down in the lower part of the universe. And he has power over the demons. That's the region in the Vedic cosmology. Below the earth, there are uh, subterranean worlds where demons live. And so Varuna has control over them. Therefore, he has this name, Ahura Maya. He has Maya or power over the demons. And uh, you'll find that Varuna is in his undersea kingdom is served by demons. Therefore, you, f you see this in Krishna book when uh, um, Maharaj, um, Nanda Maharaj, who was Krishna's father, once took a, a bath uh, in the uh, Jamuna river in the early morning. He was arrested by one of Varuna's demons and he took him down to the palace of Varuna when he was held in captivity. And then Krishna went there. Krishna dove into the water and went all the way to the uh, Varuna Loka and demanded of Varuna, you give my father back. And Varuna was very apologetic. He, he apologized. He said, one of my foolish demon servants made a mistake and brought your father here. I'm very sorry. Please forgive me. <laughs> so you can see from that that Varuna is served by Asuras. Another example is Sankashura. The Lord, uh, the Lord carries uh, the Shanka, the, the conch shell, which was the home of one demon that he killed. The demon was living under the sea and he was also uh, a follower of Varuna. So uh, Varuna is Ahura, uh, Asura Maya, the Lord of the demons. Now, uh, it turns out <coughs> that this uh, uh, Jaruta was taking the side of the demons in his worship of Varuna, which is what Vishishta does not do. 
Because although Varuna, as I said, although he's, he has control over the demons, he himself is not a demon. He belongs to the Adityas. There are 12 Adityas who, who uh, hope it doesn't get too complicated. <laughs> there are 12 demigods who take turns uh, um, piloting the sun, Surya. Surya means the sun. So with every month, the demigod who is riding in the chariot of the sun across the heaven changes. So there are 12 Adityas. And in the Chandogya Upanishad, one Vedic text, it said, Varuna is the chief of these 12. He's the leader of the other 11. So he's worshipped by demigods also. He's respected by the demigods, by the pious. <coughs> but it's interesting, this Varuna, because he has a connection to the demons, therefore, uh, uh, for, for example, he gave his daughter, his first daughter, named Varuni, to Shukracharya, who's the spiritual master of the demons. And you may know, for you'll know from the Bhagavatam, those who have read, that there is a very ancient uh, conflict between Shukracharya, the spiritual master of the demons, and Brihaspati, who is the spiritual master of the demigods. So Brihaspati's other name is Angirasa. And from there we get this name, Ang uh, Angramainyu. So this is, this is the Satan in the Zoroastrian religion. The Satan is the spiritual master of the demigods. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore, in the Zoroastrian religion, the, uh, the, the godly beings, the, we would say the demigods or the angelic beings, in, in Jaruta's language, uh, there he calls them Ahuras. These are the, these are the good guys. <laughs> Ahuras are the good ones. This means, of course, Asura. The Vedic language means demon. <laughs> and and uh, the demons of the Zoroastrian religion, he calls them Devas. <laughs> <laughs> and he mentions among the Devas, there are such evil demons. Uh, he mentions specifically in this Yendavesta, and they're named Indra and Vayu, and they're presented as being very evil demons. When you turn to the Rig Veda, you'll find Indra and Vayu are demigods. <laughs> so what we see here is a, is a reversal uh, in this Zoroastrianism. Actually, the powers of darkness uh, were exalted as being powers of light. And the powers of light, because uh, Deva comes from our Sanskrit scholars here, Div, right? Which means light, it folds <laughs> So uh, the powers of light, the actual devas in the Zoroastrian religion were denigrated to powers of darkness. So you have a whole reversal here. And along with that reversal also in the Zoroastrian tradition, there's, uh, 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 there's no, no room, there's no doctrine, there's no allowance for moksha, for liberation from this world. Uh, the Zoroastrian religion follows dharma, artha, kama. That means religious principles, dharma, artha, economic development, or receiving the gifts of the worshipped gods, and then kama, enjoying this world. And that's it. You see, moksha, uh, moksha, which means getting free from this world. In the in the Vedic culture, uh, the moksha was uh, endeavored. Uh, those pursuing moksha would take sannyas. That means they would renounce at a proper age, after having fulfilled their responsibilities, they would renounce family life and uh, take up brahmacharya or celibacy and practice uh, pure spiritual activities. But in the Zoroastrian religion, celibacy is a sin. <laughs> <laughs> so there's only, uh, you know, there's only material activity. And, and you perform sacrifice and get the blessings of the Ahuras <laughs> to be successful in your material existence. And, and if you're worried that you're going to die, you don't have to worry because in the future this Sayo Shant or Messiah will come and if you've been good, you'll come out of the ground and you'll get a body and you can live on the earth forever and just enjoy life without end. So that's the theme of this Zoroastrian religion and certainly we can see this theme. It is continued on in these later Western religious traditions. Uh, uh, 
Of course, that's not to say that everything about Western religion, because there are uh, certainly uh, some uh, very uh, ideal teachers like Jesus Christ have appeared in the West and, and taught principles of bhakti. That can't be denied. But we can say that the general milieu, the general conception uh, that predominates in the Western religious tradition is, is quite materialistic. I can give you an example that I found in my research. I was looking in the uh, history of uh, this Christian idea of resurrection. Uh, and so there had been for centuries a conflict between different theologians in Christianity. There were some who were trying to say that this resurrection, what it really means is that the spiritual body is brought up. You see, the material body remains dead. But we actually have a spiritual body, and by the grace of, of Jesus, that spiritual body will be awakened and will uh, rise to join Jesus in heaven. So this was an argument given by certain theologians through the history of Christianity, but this argument was never accepted as the Christian doctrine. Rather, uh, the theologians who always won were those who took this position that no, it's not the spiritual body, it is the self-same material body, which is dead and rotting in the ground, that will come to life and be restored. Even Augustine, was one of the very important church fathers, he suggested that because there's this question, well, will the body, you know, if, if a child has died, uh, then will the body uh, uh, that's raised just be that of a little child and go to heaven as a child? Or what if it's a very old man or woman? So they'll go to heaven as an old man or woman? <laughs> and he said, no, they'll all get a body 30 years old. <laughs> And then they'll be 30 years old forever. <laughs> and this, this is the teaching of Augustine, who's one of the most important, uh, they say, church fathers. So you see this, these themes that were introduced by Zoroaster or Jar Jaruta, they have, uh, they have been maintained in these later Western religions. And so these, these religions are very definitely tinged with a lot of materialism and sometimes you you know I have met in, in the course of my uh, preaching work you meet a certain kind of Christians who belong to a very extreme wing of opinion and they will say your Krishna is a demon and, and so there's a you know there's a <laughs> <laughs> they, view, they view all the demigods as demons. <laughs> so, anyway, um, I can sit down and just bring this to a relevant Krishna conscious conclusion. So our Vaishnava philosophy, our uh, teaching of Krishna Bhakti, says that this duality, which is of so concern to this religion, good versus evil, it is actually just an illusion that is based on the body. We have this body and we perceive in this body <coughs> that there are pleasures and these pleasures are opposed by pains. And so in material life our, our inclination, our endeavor is to try to increase the pleasures and decrease the pains. So uh, this type of religion, it, it, just, it just makes a, yes, it makes a doctrine out of that. And, and that this should carry over to the next life. You should act in this life in such a way that in the next life you will attain only pleasure in the heavenly world. It means sensual pleasure. And these pleasures that are described in the Vedic scriptures and as well as, for instance, in the Quran, the scriptures of, uh, the scripture of Islam, that there are heavenly gardens on higher planets and there are uh, intoxicating drinks and there are beautiful girls in Sanskrit, they're called Apsaras, in the uh, Arabic language they're called Hauris, but they're beautiful like angelic women, and so it's like a party, you know, <laughs> in the upper part of the universe. Uh, but Bhagavad Gita tells us that all of this is temporary. No matter where you go within the material sphere of this universe, 
even to the heavenly planets. All of that is temporary. Ultimately, the whole universe will be dissolved. It will come to an end. So this type of religion is keeping the focus of our attention within this universe, within the realm of the body and physical experiences. So, uh, therefore, we, we devotees of Krishna, we call this type of religion mundane. It's mundane because it, its focus is here in the material world. So, Lord Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita that we have to transcend this duality. He says, All living entities are born into this duality of pleasure versus pain, good versus evil, whatever. Uh, and it is the mission of our life to transcend that, to come to our actual spiritual identity, which is beyond this duality. In our original transcendental spiritual activity, uh, we are uh, enjoying... What are we enjoying? Uh, an eternal relationship of love with Krishna, with Bhagavan Sri Krishna. Uh, who is the, uh, Krishna means the source of all attraction. So as I was explaining in an answer to a question the other day, that everything we're attracted to in this world, all the nice material things, are just indirect representations of Krishna's own attractive potency. But the problem is, is here everything is just a shadow. It's a shadow of Krishna. And so if one is attracted, one tries to enjoy a shadow, one will not be satisfied. So Lord Krishna uh, and Lord Krishna's transcendental boat, that is the reality on which the shadow of this material world is based. So we have to transfer our attention from this shadow, trying to enjoy this shadow world, to uh, pure devotion to Krishna. And uh, in this particular age, this modern time, we have a very, very simple way of doing that. And that is the uh, chanting of Krishna's holy name. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare, Hare Hare, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, 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 Hare Hare. So as we become practiced, as we become habituated to chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, then uh, these materialistic leanings, these materialistic tendencies to seek as the goal of our life uh, some elevated station within the material world on heaven or even on earth try to improve one's position on earth and in gain, and this way gain more and more pleasures for the body but our hearts become cleansed of all this <coughs> and uh, we become we taste uh, transcendental satisfaction as spiritual beings as eternal spiritual beings in loving relationship with the supreme eternal personality of Godhead Lord Krishna. So all of this can be directly realized by anyone and everyone through this process of chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. So I, I would like to stop here at 5.30. Uh, the next, what comes next? Will it be the feast? Or yeah, the feast will be next. So. The devotees will be serving a feast that's been offered to Krishna, transcendental uh, food stuff called prasadam, and you will all certainly enjoy that. Uh, but uh, we have a few minutes where I could answer some questions if you have any. Yes? I would like to ask, uh, when Jesus left this planet, is there any mention in the Vedas? Is he in the spiritual sky now, or is he... Well, Srila Prabhupada said Jesus Christ comes from Brahma Loka. Yes. Uh, because it's mentioned in the second canto of Srimad Bhagavatam that on the Brahma Loka, which is the planet of Brahma, topmost planet in this universe, that there are many sages who reside there, along with Brahma. And they're uh, in a state, in Sanskrit, the technical term is uh, Labto Prashanti, which is in a state of spiritual satisfaction, uh, but their hearts get moved by compassion for uh, the fallen members of human society, and so sometimes they come down from Brahma Loka, and uh, the, they take the role of teachers, and they introduce some, some sort of dharma or religion uh, to help bring people upward to a higher status of life. 
that's what we learned from Shiva Prabhupada. Yes, Arthur, there's uh, the creation. You see, Brahma will create. Is it the of Brahma creating the world? Well, Brahma is the uh, original uh, creator um, of the species of life. He's, he's given that responsibility by Krishna, but then he passes that responsibility also onward to his own sons and daughters. Uh, he generates uh, great demigods known as Prajapatis, and he gives them the order, you continue to create. So. Um, Therefore, there are also other creators below Brahma. Uh, the, the, the biblical description of creation, it's very, very brief. <laughs> so, uh, but it seems to basically pertain uh, first to Brahma, the basic uh, uh, realms of the universe he manifests. And then, um, then there's mention of the uh, Adam as the first man. Well, that's also that story is also explained in the Bhavishya Purana. It's a little bit different from. There's also a person named Adama and his wife Abhyabhati. but they were uh, they were saintly persons living in a forest, and they became they were the uh, progenitors of all the Malechas. <laughs> <laughs> so, Prabhupada, Shiva Prabhupada says, he writes in Chaitanya Charitamrita that the Bible, the Torah, and the Quran are scriptures of the Malechas. Malecha means the uh, class of man which is outside the Vedic civilization. In the Vedic civilization, there's Brahmana, Chaturya, Vaishya, Shudra. The Malechas are not in any of these four classes, they're outside. Malecha actually in Sanskrit means untouchable. <laughs> So, so, it, so, Prabhupada says that these scriptures are Malachi scriptures, and it's interesting to note that in Genesis, the first book of uh, the Old Testament, which is uh, the, an old, very old Malachi scripture, they say uh, humanity begins with Adam and Eve, but that actually means that the Malachis begin with Adam and Eve. <laughs> Yes? <laughs> you have one question. You mentioned this in Kapoga, Lutic Alpatro, the Pipe of. And I have sometimes speculated with some theologists that in the New Testament, this is the Apocalypse of Johannes, or this is our Apocalypse of Alpatro, the Pipe of Terrors, mentioned this king who writes with a white horse and so on. So is there any connection with this? So his question is that in the last book of the New Testament, the Apocalypse, um, there is mention of a king who will appear riding a white horse and he will uh, rid the world of all kinds of evil <coughs> uh, and uh, establish the kingdom of God on earth. So he wants to know if there is a possibly a connection between this description and uh, the description of Kalki, the Kalki avatar. That's an avatar of Krishna who appears at the end of this age of Kali Yuga. So there is quite definitely a lot of similarity because it says that this king it says, it doesn't give a name, it just says his name is known to him alone, rides a white horse and carries a sword and is killing all the evil people. And the Vedas also say that Kalki appears riding a white horse which has four wings and travels at the speed of the mind as fast as you can think. Kalki moves from one place to another and he has a sword and he kills all the Malecha kings, all the evil people and cleanses the earth to start the next stage, the Satya Yuga. So, I, I will leave it at that. You can draw your own conclusion, but there's definitely a lot of similarity. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Yes, Maharaj, uh, there, there is so many symbols in Christianity and do they have connection to this or are they introduced by Jesus Christ? Symbols? Yeah, and fish and uh, 
Frozen. Well, the fish, uh, this, or Pisces, is a, uh, from what I've read, it's very, very ancient. It's, it exists as a holy symbol before Christianity. And one book I found, they say it starts with the uh, Matsya Avatar. <laughs> <laughs> That was one book I found said that, but it's a, the fish as a, as a sacred symbol exists uh, definitely in pre-Christian cultures in the Middle East, like Sumeria, Babylonia. The fish represented something divine, and so this one scholar who wrote this book was tracing it back, and the oldest divine fish form he could find was that of the Matsya Avatar, <laughs> which was interesting. Yes? Maharaj, uh, in the Bible, when we read the Bible, we get some idea of uh, some sort of ideal man. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't seem so assertive. Mm -hmm. So can you elaborate? I, I think it's quite a religious person. Well, um, the, you know, the Bible is, uh, as a whole, is a mixture of different trends or different strands of thought. So while it is to some extent true what you say, that there is a pre presentation of a, a saintliness and purity and like that, at the same time uh, you find that uh, you know there are blood sacrifices described in the Old Testament. Uh, you find, uh, I mean, the, the common understanding in Christianity, the majority of Christianity, is that there's nothing wrong with meeting him. In fact, uh, some say it is, a, is a, it is the proof of faith that one should eat meat to show that he has full trust in God. I was reading, I, when I was last in the States, I was given a book written about vegetarianism and uh, there was interviews with different vegetarian cooks and one of them was a monk of the Catholic Church who had himself became a vegetarian and cooks vegetarian and so the interviewer was asking him so how does it go in the Catholic Church you know when you uh, do you cook uh, do you prepare vegetarian feasts for your Christian brothers and he says that's very difficult he said, uh, I have a very hard time. They don't want to be vegetarian. So basically, I do these programs for people outside the church. <laughs> so, you see, these things are there. So, what, what, what the, this uh, biblical religion is, you know, it has some, some strand of karma, some strand of jnana, some strand of bhakti also. And it's all on a, on a rather basic, simplistic level, and it's all mixed together. Rupa Goswami, in his famous verse, says, Anya Vilasita Shunyam, Jnana Kamari Nagritam, Anukulina Krishna Nushilam, Bhakti Rutama. That uh, uh, the thing that must be done is that the karma and the jnana must be separated from bhakti. And all these Anya Vilasita Shunyam means all other desires, except, from, except for the desire to love and serve Krishna, they should be nullified. And then what you have at the end, this pure bhakti, that is the highest expression of religion. Bhakti is uttama. Uttama means supreme. So, it's true you will find in the Bible there are some uh, references to bhakti, to devotion. It is certainly there, but it is mixed up with other things. And that makes it a problem. Uh, there has been no systematic, you know, dividing the bhakti, the devotion, from the karma and the jnana and the other things. Uh, and, and there's been no um, effort to say in very clear language, this and this alone is what we should do to perfect ourselves. So, Srila Prabhupada said, the problem with the Bible is that it is various texts coming from various different uh, people. Uh, some may have been saints and some may have been so-called saints, but 
their books were put together in one volume and you have to sort it out yourself. Yes? Uh, one thing I start to think about, you mentioned uh, this uh, Praksha about this. Um, so, like one, uh, Prabhupada mentions this uh, Fiji Lakta in the Bhagavad Gita, planet with the forefathers. Uh, I, I understood that uh, they are, uh, this is going to make sense to me, that they would be our like, biological forefathers. So who are actually who are actually the forefathers who are living in Fiji Lakta? Yes, uh, these are our ancestors. You know, in, in religions around the world, there is ancestor worship. So that means uh, the past generations of our family, uh, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, uh, mother, grandmother, great-grandmother. So this is part of uh, karma kanda. I was speaking of these things, <coughs> karma, dhyana, and bhakti. So in karma kanda, this is required that one worships one's forefathers. After they depart, there's a, a sacrifice, a ceremony. And that ceremony should be sustained year after year. And this ceremony keeps uh, the forefather, the soul of the forefather, in a heavenly planet called Pitriloka. Now, the Pitriloka is simultaneously it's connected to the moon and simultaneously connected to uh, uh, Yamaraj's planet. There's a region of Yamaraj's planet which is heavenly his own court. It's, he's the fifth canto of Bhagavatam. He's called Pitri Raj. He's the king of the Pitris. And so his own personal court where he resides is a heavenly place and the forefathers are there and great brahmanas are there and sacrifices are going on. So uh, as long as these sacrifices of, of karma are performed then the forefathers can remain in that heavenly situation. And what happens is, is that by this connection to forefathers, then uh, uh, souls from the Pitri Loka, they descend into families on earth that are worshipping them. So in this way, the, the, the uh, family tradition, uh, a good family tradition is kept up generation after generation. You get good, pious, I mean in the karma kanda sense anyway, good, pious souls who descend, who perform sacrifices, who follow the principles of karma kanda. And then this is, this provides a, a very stable basis for varna ashram dharma, for Vedic civilization. But in the Kali Yuga, all this, uh, this type of religious practices, they disappear. Even this, this type of ancestor worship was used to be performed in, in Western the Western world, at least pre-Christian Western world. Uh, in China, it's known they worship ancestors. In India, India still, among uh, pious Hindus, this goes on. But in Kali Yuga, this, this type of karma kanda religion fades away because this, this uh, age is too contaminated. And people lose their interest in these things. And they become degraded as a result, they become like animals. And then that means the Pitris can't, you know, they can't stay in the Pitri Loka any longer. And they fall down too. Because, that, because you know, as uh, our uh, Vajna philosophy teacher said that uh, what, what is your consciousness at uh, the moment of death? Uh, that is what you reach. And why don't the ancestors, uh, you know, why, uh, how do they go to Pitri Loka? Why don't they go like <laughs> someplace that what is their consciousness? Uh, why like, uh, well, you see, this is the thing. The, this, this process of worship, you see, because what is that, what, the principal attachment that people have in this world is to their family. I mean, the, the, the Srimad Bhagavatam tells us that this family attachment is the strongest attachment of all, most difficult to break. So this uh, worship of the Pitris, Shraddha ceremony, Karma Kanda, is um, engaging that attachment. In, in, a, in a religious process. So, although they're so attached thinking of their families, they can still be elevated by this process to a heavenly planet, Pichiloka, where the family members go and reside for a long time until Kali Yuga comes and they have to fall from their family. So it, it is a method of elevation for those who are still very attached to 
to material family relationships. <coughs> okay. Yes? In your explanation, you explained about uh, the Indian, uh, Krishna consciousness and Christianity, we start with Zoroastrian Buddhism. So where did you separate spiritual world and material world in your explanation? And what is this spiritual world? What is, is it, uh, does it have a relationship between cosmos and the uh, spirit? Yes. Um, well, I want to make clear that I think I heard you uh, say that you understood I said both Krishna consciousness and Christia Christianity come from Zoroastrianism? No, that, that was not what I said. I said the Western religious tradition, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, comes from Zoroastrianism. And then Zoroastrianism is a kind of uh, deviation from uh, the ancient Vedic religion of India. So Krishna consciousness comes out of that Vedic religion. It, it's, not, it's not involved here. But this is also Veda. You're talk, talking about Veda. Here. Yeah, there's a connection, but it's distorted. It is very distorted. <laughs> but it does has, it have its roots in the Vedas. So as far as the other part of your question, the spiritual world, yeah, the this, this spiritual world is beyond this material cosmos entirely. Um, this, what we call this cosmos or universe, is a covering of ignorance of pure consciousness. You, yes, we are spirit. Each one of us is a spiritual being. Our soul uh, is conscious, pure consciousness. <coughs> but uh, uh, our consciousness has been covered by the impressions of this material world. Um, on this planet and all planets, these are all material impressions which cover our consciousness. So uh, Krishna consciousness or this pure spiritual consciousness, the spiritual world, and this occurs when uh, that material covering of our consciousness is just removed. It's like pulling back a curtain and then one sees beyond the uh, impressions of matter into the realm of transcendence, pure spirit, which is eternal, full of knowledge, full of bliss, and ever expanding. It's, it's a realm of love of God, pure love of God. A realm of rasa, loving relationships with God. Krishna's presence. All right, so I'm very thankful to you all that you're so interested and you have many, many questions, but uh, the program also must go on. <laughs> So I would like to stop here so that this feast can be served. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So what I mean to say is that, uh, anyway, if we need a society where we, where we respect each other, where we respect each other, and also where we are very, very clear about reality. Reality is that Prabhupada is saving all of us. That's reality. If you don't know that, you'd better learn it. Because that's what's really happening in your life. That's why you're here. That's why you're, that's why you're devoted. Because Prabhupada is saving all of us. And